Attention podcast listener, we've got an exciting new podcast coming just for patrons of patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. Talking Futurama Season 2 Part 1 has begun exclusively for our $5 and up patrons on the Talking Simpsons Network. That's the first 10 episodes of Futurama coming to you once a week. So just sign up for $5 a month at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons and you'll get Talking Futurama Season 2 and all of our limited miniseries, including the entirety of Talking Futurama Season 1. That's 13 episodes. That is patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. Now please enjoy the rest of this podcast. I heartily endorse this event or product. Ahoy hoy everybody, welcome to Talking Simpsons, recorded in a little girly, underpantsy, pink doily tea party place. I'm your host, Beanie Baby Bootlegger, Bob Mackey, and this is our chronological exploration of The Simpsons. Who else is here with me today? Henry Gilbert, and don't you dare call me a greenhorn. And who do we have on the line? Luke Savage here, just uh, gorging myself on some uh, beef-flavored beef. Mm, and today's episode is Maximum Homer Drive. There's still food, but I don't want to eat it. I've become everything I've ever hated. <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode aired on March 28th, 1999. And as always, Henry will tell us what happened on this mythical day in real world history. <gasps> oh, my God. Oh, boy, Bobby. WrestleMania 15 happens in Philadelphia. Ed TV is number one at the box office. And Futurama debuts right after The Simpsons with Space Pilot 3000. Uh, and it will be at the same time slot for one more episode before being escorted away to Tuesday, mm-hmm. where it can't hurt anyone. It's, it's family guy time after that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, please check out Talking Futurama on our Patreon, by the way. You can hear all the first season and now the second season exclusively on the Patreon. WrestleMania 15, that is the one headlined by The Rock versus <laughs> Stone Cold. That's There's the a knowing look at Henry's eyes. <laughs> I'm kind of happy our guest, uh, I, I assume that Luke is not a big wrestle head. Uh, I, it wasn't part of my childhood, okay. I confess. It wasn't mine either, so I assume that if there was a guest who knew a lot about wrestling, we'd, we'd spend like 20 minutes on yes. this WrestleMania. <laughs> oh, man, if you're you're lucky Nima Shirazi's not here. Oh, again. yeah. Uh, surprising. Is Nima, surprising. Nima's into wrestling? Oh, yeah. Me, me and him could go on about it for a long time. What was the biggest uh, bout? A uh, wrestling at, bout? At WrestleMania 15? Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was the main event of Stone Cold. It's facing The Rock. Uh, also, is sponsored by Crispy M&M's. Mm, there, Stone there versus Rock. <laughs> But no, yeah, Nima is super into it. I mean, uh, he also can talk a lot about the intersection of politics and wrestling. We went on a long talk about how Vince is, Vince McMahon's writing of wrestling in the late 90s was really about how much he hated Bill Clinton and how that drove him. And uh, now they're, they're all over the pol- politics news as the week of this recording because of a big brouhaha that happened when they did their blood money show in Saudi Arabia. It was, uh, it's really fucked up. Yes. What was the other thing? There was Futurama, WrestleMania. I always forget and one of them. TV. Oh, Ed TV. Mm-hmm. Ed 209's uh, movie after uh, Robocop. Uh, I saw that on an airplane once. What do you think? Which of is it? which is the appropriate place to watch it, I think. It's it's about on the level of an airplane film, yeah. It's uh mm-hmm. It, it was a real, you know, 90s end of history comment on, like, uh, where does reality TV end? Is it going to just watch you all the time? My, my memory of it, and admittedly, uh, yeah, I have not seen it since I was on a plane at some point as a kid, is that it was sort of like a raw deal Truman show mm. with, like, uh, Matthew McConaughey subbing in for uh, Jim Carrey. Mm. Yeah, pretty much. It's uh, But it's, like, lower stakes and less imaginative, and it's, it is really just, it's a dingier whole product like one of the first one joke is that the first time ed tv begins is him waking up in the morning wood and he rubs himself through his pants and they're like boy this is this television now i guess i don't think i've seen the movie that's the one scene i know about from that movie (laughs) a morning wood scene but i think the fact that there was a movie called ed out at the same time ruined the seo (laughs) so ed was the baseball playing monkey the classic morning wood scene you (laughs) can forget I do also remember in Ed TV, it was the first time I recognized Clint Howard appearing in a Ron Howard directed film. I was like, oh, hey, that's Clint Howard. I know him from Jokes on Mystery Science Theater or some such. In the movie Ice Cream Man. <laughs> also, a super weird episode of the original Star Trek where he plays a baby or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, spa- ugly space baby. <laughs> yeah. He's, everybody's drinking Tranya with him. Mm. 
Uh, so today's special guest yes. is uh, Luke Savage of the amazing Michael and Us podcast. Welcome Ooh. back, Luke. I think your last episode was uh, season eight's Mountain of Madness back in October of 2018. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me back, guys. Always a pleasure. Uh, we've been. I've been really enjoying. You know, we've been really enjoying. <laughs> I've been enjoying it the most. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh, your your recent spate of episodes have been really great. Like I loved hearing your thoughts on the Democrat debate from a couple months ago and the the Trudeau boxing documentary documentary which was all news to me i didn't know any of that stuff about uh trudeau that was oh, really well, cheers good. yeah the non-political thing i really liked was your episode about the british version of the office because i'm currently going through the american version for the first time and now i really want to go back and watch the british one again it's been a yeah, long time it, w- it was incredible to revisit it because when i was a teenager you know and i mean in my early 20s as well i watched i mean i watched the shit out of it i i've probably seen i mean no exaggeration i have probably seen every episode of that show i mean there's only 12 of them plus the special <laughs> i've probably seen each one i mean conservatively 10 or 15 times and so you know i thought uh, it was going to be very kind of workmanlike to go back and revisit it because i was going to remember everything and even though I did remember much of it very well, I think both Will and I received it completely differently because I remember it being like exclusively a comedy. And I mean, it is a comedy, but it's it's bleaker and much darker than than I'd remembered or than I kind of received it as when I was uh, when I was a teenager. And I think that owes itself in large part to having been through grueling jobs and, mm-hmm. and you know, having spent much of my 20s sitting behind desks and things like that. So yeah, that was uh, that was fun to revisit. The American one's fun too, but I don't think, I, and I think it's like really tightly written. The actors are great. I, I don't think it has quite the same depth as, of, uh, as social commentary maybe as the British one. That's true. Yeah, I can't go as dark either. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about, you know, comparing the just David Brent versus Michael Scott. And like David Brent is just like this despicable creature, like with almost no redeeming qualities, basically. Like he he makes the wrong choice and selfish choice every time. While on the show, uh, the U.S. workplace, they make it much more the like, well, Michael is just a buffoon in over his head and he's make stupid decisions but you kind of feel bad for him and want to help him sometimes he's fun like yeah well i mean and that that was followed like directly by parks and rec which was just about like well your manager's great actually and works too hard on everything way (laughs) more than you hard to go back to that (laughs) i don't you guys got to do that one i don't want to i feel like every time we have a podcast on i tell them do this episode we'll give you homework (laughs) when you come on our show honestly honestly that there have been a lot of requests for parks and rec and i think the only thing that's kind of held us back from doing it is that i mean i've only seen a few episodes i don't know how many will seen but um it would just be a little more labor intensive because i feel like to really get a an idea of it we would have to watch quite a few episodes but we'll definitely do it at some point i think it's Hmm. prime michael and us material for sure looking forward to it you know ed tv i uh that's like carl reiner's in it and uh, ellen too like it's definitely a 90s liberal kind of film as well i'd say oh we we will definitely be doing ed tv in fact uh in fact, I think like maybe eight or nine years ago, Will and I had like we got a solid year of kind of inside jokes out of Ed TV. I don't even remember what caused it to come up, but uh, <laughs> we used to talk about Ed TV a lot. So I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, I'm sure we'll dive back into that one at some point. And yeah, another of your recent episodes it was about the Canadian election that uh, was a nice primer for an American like me was learning that Ed the Sock still is happening, which really saddened me. Well, to say that he's still happening suggests you knew about him to begin with, which I'm very impressed by, if that's the case. <laughs> my Canadian how you, girlfriend. How the hell do you know about Ed the Sock? Oh, my Canadian girlfriend had to tell me what it was. Oh, wow. I I learned about it because in the late 90s, early 2000s, I guess it's called Much Music, or it was then. Mm. Yeah. That started broadcasting in the U.S., so when I was flipping around for like all the cool v- music videos, I would flip to that one and see some of the stuff on there. It's a lesser <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> don't care for it going to much music in high school was like that was like my idea at 15 or 16 of what like the coolest field trip would, would could possibly be i remember i think i i don't think i actually went i think like my high school class went and i somehow missed it hmm. but there was like a high school like a class trip to a live taping of uh of much music like in the studio where you know you'd be on the camera for 30 seconds while the the vjs were like priming up the next uh the next video or something <laughs> i thought that would that was super cool i i had just figured that the sock was like a two-year thing and then once it it run its course that we would it just stopped but uh someone's well, dying like, out i guess 
Twitter has thrown a life raft to all kinds <laughs> of things like that. And also, I guess, Luke, did you, did you watch this episode of The Simpsons when it was new back in 99? Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure I would have seen this during its first run. And I might have mentioned this the last time I was on, but uh, the CBC, which is Canada's public broadcaster, used to uh, broadcast The Simpsons every day at five, like or every weekday. So I'd come back from school and I watched The Simpsons and I caught a lot of things during their first run. Yeah, so we can thank uh, the Canadian state. Taxpayer money wow. uh, enabled me to watch The Simpsons. Man, it's just like Michael Moore said, it's perfect up there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm heading up there soon. But yeah, this episode, so it's written by John Swartzwelder. It's got a lot of John Swartzwelder things in it and that it's based around a fad that is uh, more than 20 years old. Of, of the time of this episode's airing, uh, you know, the truck craze of the 70s it also is a uh, virulently anti-union and it shits all over lisa so all yeah. the john Schwartzwelder calling cards are here totally yeah a lot of his libertarian uh, uh axes were grinded in this one for and sure. actually i remember in our second mike scully interview he was talking about unionizing uh the animated shows on fox in the late 90s yeah and he said he tried to do it earlier but there was a vote and people voted against it and he learned democracy doesn't work <laughs> so I'm, I'm guessing john Schwartzwelder voted against the writers union I wonder yeah he his mistake was leaving it to uh to a unanimous vote instead of just doing it with like 51 percent or whatever and but not only did futurama air but i think the prim the premiere of futurama in fact aired uh the same night as this one i could be wrong oh no, no. you're right yeah they they wanted the 830 slot they thought they'd have it forever but they soon lost it and they were very very mad about that so it's funny to think of people going from straight from senior ding dong into the start of the first episode of Futurama. Yeah, I don't even associate that episode with uh, Futurama premiering. I just don't know why. I don't think of this episode as what pre- like uh, preceded it. I think the po- I think I might have taped the first episode on my tape right after this. Like I know I did. Yeah, tape. yeah. But Futurama DVDs came out soon enough after the premiere that I either watched that or I watched my illegal downloads on Kazaa mm. or uh, no the no LimeWire, Lime Emule. One yeah. of those virus devices. <laughs> yeah, I want to point out before this episode starts is that uh, a lot of animated shows will do trucking episodes. So there were 23 episodes of The Critic. We covered all of them in our Talking Critic miniseries. There's an episode where Jay Sherman becomes a truck driver, uh, an easy rider. Mm-hmm. And then in four years, there'll be a King of the Hill episode where Hank is a trucker for like wow. a day. So yeah. I don't know why. I guess it's writers who grew up in the 70s when this trucking fad was happening. They would think, oh, that's a fun idea for our characters to be in. So, yeah. What, what exactly is the like social etymology of the trucking fad because like i'm vaguely aware of it and the the tropes that i recognize of it like such as they are were obviously in this episode but where does that come from you know in the 70s there was this just popular there was like there was this view of truckers in in movies and uh, in television shows like bj and the bear of just like that you are the new cowboy like you just go from one end of the world to the other and you go on so many adventures and meet cool people and you're just like this you new new rugged brand of masculinity i think was how it was pitched in the 70s that right and it i think for the writers it's kind of stuck with them from then of just like well what would be a cool masculine job for the dad on our tv cartoon to get into and uh i mean that comes through a lot in this episode of homer just around all these tough guys with gruff voices yeah my uncle uh was a trucker i assume he's retired now i haven't talked to him in a while but uh like i said on king of the hill podcast we've done he was essentially dale gribble like uh (laughs) mirrored sunglasses baseball cap over a bald head uh, only he had a mustache, <laughs> but he always wore flannel. Uh, but he would come back from his trucking trips bringing us different flavors of Snapple we couldn't get and like tapes of Howard Stern he recorded because Howard Stern was not airing in our region <laughs> over the radio. So uh, he brought back the treasures of America to us. I, I had a friend growing up who whose dad was a trucker. And uh, I remember just being in awe of the fact that he got to not only ride in the truck while it was going, but sleep in it because it had a little like cabin in the back or like basically just a bunk bed but what really blew my mind was that he was able to play his n64 on a tv in the truck as it was driving to like nashville or wherever whatever run he was doing (laughs) i think i don't think i would enjoy enjoy driving to nashville in a truck and playing n64 now uh, quite as much as i would have in (laughs) 1999 but that was a cool idea to me when I was a kid. And if you think truckers are cool cowboys, my uncle lived with his mother until he was in his late 40s. So uh, <laughs> it bought him a lot of trips to Africa where he murdered the entire cast of The Lion King over and over oh, again. Oh, how nice. Yeah. <laughs> He's- 
Oh. <laughs> uh, also, this episode's name gives me pause every time. I'm I like, hate it. Is this the Max Power episode? And no, it's not. It comes three episodes after Homer to the Max. And also the Yardley Smith connection because she was in mm. the Stephen King directed Maximum Overdrive. That's right. Yes, playing a hick. She's great at that. Uh, have you seen that one, Luke? I have not, I confess. Oh, you're you're missing out on some great bad movies. It's so just look up the trailer for it because Stephen King hosts the trailer and in with crazy eyes that he later admits like he was full of coke every day. He yeah, was that and fun. the entire cast was drunk. They would just drink all day. <laughs> uh, but but in the trailer with with crazy eyes looking at the camera, Stephen King's like, all these people adapted my stories. They got it all wrong. I'm gonna scare the hell out of you. <laughs> it's, uh, Yardley Smith. She does interviews about it. She's not like a shame of the film or anything she's she's in on the joke now the, the camp value of it for sure uh, and uh, right before we get into the every clip in it i did want to have a special shout out to the assistant director on this because the uh swinton scott the director on the commentary mentions he was a real big part of it and that's uh james purdom who we don't talk much about the assistant directors on these uh, but these, you know, the unsung heroes of the animation side of Simpsons, he worked on Simpsons as early as season six in the ca- character layout department. Uh, he would ne- he never fully directed a Simpsons episode, but would graduate to full directing on Futurama in season three and uh, has been the supervising director of Family Guy for the last 13 years. Wow. So what a rise to power. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also on the commentary, they joke that the episode idea came from Donick Carey. uh, And they say that at the time they were doing the commentary, which was like 2007, he's off in Eastern Europe making some cartoon, which I have to guess is Little Bush they're talking about. Oh, yeah. I think they mentioned Little Bush. Uh, The, um, you know, the perfect time to make your anti-Bush cartoon is 2007. It's safe. It's a safe time. Luke, you must have sampled that. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, man. Were you aware of Little Bush? Uh... Remind me, jog it's, my memory. It, as if the entire uh, cabinet of, of George W. Bush's White House were children. In a Muppet Baby style parody cartoon. I don't know how I missed that, but oh, I'm going to have man. to check it out. It's uh, it's a great one. Another man, uh, uh, Sorry I've suggested now like five <laughs> episodes for you guys to do. But. A, lot of, a lot of homework from this <laughs> one, but that's cool. <laughs> uh, but yes, the episode begins with a very classic like crazy like this is where season 10 is at its peak where they're just crazy and ridiculous things happen and they start with homer high-fiving about turning down a tonight's shot after uh lenny bit him and uh, we'll never know why lenny bit him <laughs> but uh <laughs> but lisa comes in in uh as a giant stick in the mud the second she shows up i said to that nurse you can take your free tetanus shot and shove it well you told her dad you better Delete my good. good. You still haven't told us why Lenny bit you. Well, I really gave him no choice, you see. <laughs> Lousy meat eating scum. Huh? Not you. I'm going over to protest this disgusting new restaurant called the Slaughterhouse. It's decorated with hanging steer carcasses and a fountain of blood. Ooh, I heard about that place on the Red Grocer. The worst part is, you pick out your own cow and they kill it right in front of you. Well, maybe the animals don't mind, honey. They might enjoy being the center of attention. I think I read somewhere that cows like being killed. <laughs> Wait, there's a place like that in Springfield? Then why are we eating this crap? <laughs> so that line about uh, I heard somewhere cows like being killed for a long time. I thought that was in Lisa the Vegetarian until we did it for <laughs> our uh, podcast. But I love that line because I am a pescatarian and I only fish. And when I try to explain one question, my choices, I do hear like, well, actually, it's more humane to kill those chickens. Like things like that, where it's like it's close to what Bart is saying. So I always laugh at that line. I mean, people get so defensive about uh, if you don't eat some types of meats or if you have any dietary choices people get very defensive and treat you like they treat lisa in this very episode and lisa's story goes nowhere (laughs) she's uh it just introduces the uh the plot basically my my favorite part of this scene is is how you know it just opens in meteor res and you know homer's been bitten by lenny but it's just never (laughs) expounded upon it's just like oh that happened 
Yeah, uh, in another episode, Lenny bit him while they were like in a fight, or somehow Homer left him with no choice. I just, uh, I, I think actual cases of lockjaw in the 20th century happened more on TV than actual real life. <laughs> It's one of those funny diseases you yeah. can laugh at, but uh. you know what? You know what? Part of this, the, the clip you just played, I, I didn't, I, di- I don't really get. Is Marge has read about the restaurant? Is that like a magazine she's referring to? What is the, what is the reference there? Oh, I have the answer to that. I think these segments were duplicated in other cities, but there was in the Bay Area a guy who who did a segment on the local news called The Green Grocer, where he was just saying, this guy named Joe Carcioni, who was like, you know, you got to go to your local market and get some bell peppers. They're great or whatever. Actually, here, let's, I do have a clip of The Green Grocer here. Joe Carcioni, your greengrocer, inviting you to join me on Action News weekdays at 12 noon and 5 o'clock for my daily reports on fresh fruits and vegetables. I'll give you... Vegetable. Vegetable. That's how you say that word. We had one of those guys in my uh, local news. I think it was a syndicated show, but his name was Mr. Food. Oh. What an imaginative name for a uh, food guy. (laughs) So I would guess the joke is that in the Springfield market, they have a all meat grocer who is the red grocer instead of the green grocer i'm i'm guessing that's what the joke is but i didn't know that until this this time of of questioning that line there was there was another bit i had to google as well in this one that i was like oh i never thought about that line before this whole bit with lisa it's very south park it feels very reactionary in a south park style especially in that it's a uh, South Park did these jokes all the time of like, these annoying hippies by protesting actually made something more popular because caring about something is stupid and so you must be punished. That's what happens with Lisa here. She wants to protest it and she actually sends her whole family to eat there and what ended up being an advertisement for the place. Yeah, that's exactly like all, all the worst South Park episodes. The premise is like, People who are socially concerned about something are actually the ones causing the problem to begin with, and their efforts to resolve it always exacerbate things or make them worse. And the way Lisa describes it, the slaughterhouse sounds incredibly gross and unsanitary. Dirty, yeah. I mean, and a person dies that day at there, so I think Lisa was proven correct in uh, in boycotting the place. Well, I do like with the slaughterhouse that the it has a kind of presentation like Red Lobster, except with mammals who you eat. And I do think it's making some kind of commentary on if you had to see them kill a cow like they kill a lobster, you wouldn't eat there. Like that would be disgusting to you. And the joke is that everybody is doesn't seem to care that cows are dying around them every right, right in front of them. Yeah, especially yeah. the scene with well, Burns. Yeah, I was going to say, like, especially this thing where Burns just, like, is constantly changing his mind to the point where they kill all these cows, and then the end of the gag is like, oh, I'd like some milk, actually, from that cow. And then they just, instead of milking the cow, they just kill it. Just, and it's like, this is how disposable animals are, especially to, like, a rich asshole like this. At some point in production, they thought of doing it on screen. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, that, that, I'm glad they did it off screen. It's good the, uh, the No Country for Old Men gun goes off screen yeah, to kill the cows. That's how, when I saw No Country for Old Men, I was like, oh, that's uh, Mr. Burns' cow-killing gun. I know that machine. Uh, also, uh, credit to the animators. When they arrive at the slaughterhouse, Red, Burns, and Hibbert are all at table. Like they, they are all established as attending there. And there's a fun little, there's a fun little Easter egg with Dr. Hibbert where it turns out that he's, uh, he's like just bought a steak in the restaurant <laughs> or whatever. So he's not concerned. He has no health concerns at all. He's just covering for the place. I wonder if they got him to buy in to cover them for uh, any <laughs> medical problems. Uh, and also the, uh, the neon sign when they arrive at the slaughterhouse of like the, the cow getting decapitated, but the, de- it, it doesn't smile until it's decapitated. <laughs> Yeah. It's the decapitated face that's smiling. Oh, I miss that. That's awesome. It's oh, so I want to talk about what this is a parody of. So oh. this restaurant is a parody of this uh, restaurant in Amarillo, Texas called The Big Texan. I believe it opened in the 60s, maybe 1960. So they have a 72-ounce steak challenge, and that is the steak that Homer turns down. Mm-hmm. That's not big enough for him. <laughs> so this is also parodied on an episode of King of the Hill previously that fall called, and they call it Bobby Love. It won an Emmy, and in the end of the episode, Bobby tries to beat this challenge to like show up as... Uh, vegetarian ex-girlfriend oh, yeah. played by uh, Buffy. 
the Vampire it's, Slayer. Uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar. There you go. Yeah. I, so my, my my contribution to the steak discussion is that uh, so I can't I didn't know that the seventy two ounce steak was a real thing, but uh, I was curious, you know, how uh, how many calories would be in a steak like that? So I put seventy two ounces in grams into Google. <laughs> Apparently, that's like over two thousand grams. And uh, the like macro calculator I typed it into says that a sirloin steak of 72 grams would be like four and a half thousand calories, oh my God. which is amazing. Wow. Well, Homer's steak is uh, 256 ounces based on Whoa. the amount of pounds it is. So I want to, so there are rules to this big Texan uh, contest where, so it's a 72 ounce steak and you pay $72 if you can't finish it. So uh, number one, the entire meal must be completed in one hour. If any of the meal is not consumed, swallowed, you lose. Number two, but before the time starts, you'll be allowed to cut into the steak and take one bite. If the steak tastes good and is cooked to your satisfaction, we will start the time upon your acceptable approval. Okay, that's The fair. time will not stop. The contest is on, so make sure before you say yes. Number three, once you have started, you are not allowed to stand up, leave your table, or have anyone touch the meal. Touch is uh, in big letters. Ah. Uh, number four, you will be disqualified if anyone assists you in cutting, preparing, or the eating of your meal. This is your contest. Number five, you don't have to eat the fat, but we will judge this. Judge. Uh, number six, should you become ill, the contest is over. You lose. Please uh, oh, use man, the container provided as necessary. Funny, that's such a funny <laughs> detail that, like, the contest revolves around a very simple challenge, just finish the steak. But then they add this uh, this qualitative element into it where it's like, you don't have to eat the fat, but we're going to judge it. And I love the idea that then, like, there's just three judges sitting there like, you know, uh, <laughs> figure skating or something, and they're going to give, like, they're going to hold up a sign that says, like, you know, 8, 9, 10, like, based on whether you ate the fat or not. I wonder if they assort me, like, I wonder if they give you a formal score at the end. But sorry, I have five <laughs> like, more like rules eating, to get through. Like eating the fat is like the double axle, triple toe of, like, competitive stage. <laughs> oh, he pulled it off. There's still five more rules? There's My still five God. more rules. I'm wow. sorry, I have to get through them all. Oh, so number yeah. seven, uh, you are required to pay the full amount up front. If you win, we will fund it $100. Uh, number eight, you must sit at a table that we assign. Number nine, if you do not win the steak challenge, you are welcome to take the leftovers with you. Hey, that's nice. Hey, okay, at least you get that. Yeah. Uh, number ten, no consumption or sharing of leftovers is allowed in the restaurant once the contest is over. What? That's what? weird. What do you care? So you, you can't lost. you can't divvy up your steak to hungry patrons. Uh, number eleven, final rule: if you fail to complete the challenge, you must pay the full seventy-two dollars, and that is the Big Texan Steak Challenge. Wow! But you have to uh, eat all the fixings too. Ugh! Yuck! So, do you know how how many people have actually completed this challenge? I'm sure it's been done. Actually, when I Googled this, I found that a woman ate three of them. What she said. Yes. That is the sirloins a lot then. That has to be the equivalent of what Red actually eats in this episode. I assume it's not done very often, but uh, it happens. Eight, three of yeah. them. That's insane. I mean, I had a steak recently because I went to a thing where a company was paying for it. So I was like, I'm getting the steak. When I had it like after... I think I, I was like 10 ounces of steak. After 10 of that, I just felt like sweaty and gross. Like I, that much red meat sounds like a killer, like literally a killer. The woman who ate three of those 72 ounce steaks uh, weighs 124 pounds. What? So she's not a very large person either. What? Yeah, I don't know. This this woman, uh, I'm scared of her now. I'm sorry to keep going on, but about, she also ate three baked potatoes, three side salads, three rolls, and three shrimp cocktails. I'm not reading this out of Weekly World News. What? This is an actual news story. I cannot believe this. this I'm calling crazy. fake news on this. I don't know how that's <laughs> even possible. There is a YouTube video of this. You can watch it. Her name is Molly Schuler, Sh Shiler, and uh, yeah, it's um, she's doing it. Wow. She's doing it for America. The Simpsons will be right back. Hope you guys are enjoying this week's podcast and your complimentary basket of hooves. And a big thank you to this week's guest, Luke Savage. You should definitely follow his podcast, Michael and Us, as well as his writing on Jacobin. And in case you're new to the podcast, you should know this week and every week is brought to you by patreon.com slash talking simpsons that's right me and bob are supported doing this full time by wonderful folks like you out there who give us five bucks a month to help us do this but you get so many things for that five bucks not only could you hear next week's episode of talking simpsons right now but you could also listen to next week's episode of what a cartoon our sister podcast where me and bob go through a different animated series each week that's 
two weekly podcasts for you right there. But also your five bucks gets you so many exclusive to Patreon podcasts, including many interviews with the folks who have worked on The Simpsons, some as early as the Tracy Ullman days. I think you folks will like our most recent one where we talked to Mike Scully about how he unionized the writer's room. Also, we have a Patreon exclusive mini series where me and Bob do the talking Simpsons treatment to related series like the entire series of The Critic, the first season of King of the Hill, and the first two seasons of Futurama, the second season part one is rolling out right now. You'll hear a new one every Friday at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. So please consider signing up today at Patreon. And if you greenhorns really want to step it up on Patreon, you can sign up at the $10 level. The exclusive premium a monthly What A Cartoon Movie podcast will be yours on top of all those other $5 bonuses. Once a month, me and Bob go through a different animated feature film, sometimes for over four hours. Our most recent one was Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. This month, Toy Story. And if you sign up, you get to hear the entire back catalog as well over a year of What A Cartoon Movies. You got Batman Mask of the Phantasm, Kiki's Delivery Service, Akira, a Goofy movie, Aladdin, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Tiny Toons, How I Spent My Vacation, and Cowboy Bebop the Movie, a very diverse selection of films I think you will definitely enjoy hearing us talk about. So please... Sign up at the $10 level at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. I knew about this steak challenge from seeing The Great Outdoors on HBO as a kid. Oh, yeah. Because there's a very disgusting sequence of that of John Candy. Dan Aykroyd signs John Candy up to eat the big challenge steak. And he, like, John Candy has rarely looked more disgusting than when he was covered in, like, beef fat. That, that's really Aykroyd's, gross. I'm sorry, that's Aykroyd's error in that the small people are the are the competitive eating champs, not the mm. big people, the small people. Yeah, Like yeah. that hot dog guy. <laughs> oh, God. There's a long discussion on the commentary about eating competitions and how everybody who is in one, he throws up the instance it's over, like that. It's, uh, it's very disgusting facts about it. Uh, but yes, Homer uh, signs up for the deal uh, even orders a uh i like the joke that he orders to drink meatballs because i think the normal joke you would have written would have been ordering a diet coke or it would have been like a joke that he'd order a diet drink so you, i was kind like of a waiting. side salad or something <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so instead he orders i guess pureed meatballs in a glass <laughs> like that. i just saw it i saw it as a glass full of sauce with like meatballs on the side okay. of the glass like sort of like how a lime wedge would be on the side of a gin and tonic <laughs> But Homer gets warned away by a person who isn't Tony Randall. Hmm? It's you! You're him! You're Tony Randall! <laughs> Red Barkley's my name. I'm a trucker, and I've eaten steaks from coast to coast with taters and toast. Take my advice. This one's not for greenhorns. Greenhorns? Who's a greenhorn? What's a greenhorn? It's an insult. Suck him, Dad. Suck everybody. Oh, you're just jealous because you don't have the belly for it anymore, Mr. No Belly. Mr. Hasn't Got a Belly. Well, I have just finished a whole lamb, but uh, I reckon I could take you to school. You're on, boy. Uh, I, (laughs) I like that he had just eaten a whole lamb before he wins this. I guess that's similar to that young lady. But yeah, this is this is based on the old idea of who wins eating contests being very large people not not little people who know how to like drink food basically also the tony randall thing is very like rando kind of humor but uh tony randall was a uh new thing people were making fun of again because in 1996 he married a woman named heather harlan 
who was 25 and he was 75. Mm. Um, I thought Tony Randall was gay. Was I wrong about that's that? That's why that's the joke. Okay. <laughs> that's why it's even crazier cuz what he was he was married to a woman for most of his career, then she passed away. And then he married this 25-year-old Heather Harland, and everybody was still like, "Wait, well, I was sure he was gay." Everybody, and then he has two children with her. It just confused everyone. Mm. It, it, they were a real odd couple. Uh, I have to leave now. I'm sorry. Uh, but <laughs> silence. Uh, I prefer taters over toast with a steak. That's that's mm. my. What favorite. about Texas toast? Mm, Texas toast is pretty. It's just good. garlic bread, people. Yeah. Just call it garlic mm, bread. But it's puffier, I guess. <laughs> And uh, a greenhorn for Homer's knowledge. It's an inexperienced person, and it comes from a newly slaughtered animal as one with a green oh, horn. I didn't so. realize that. Wow. Yeah, Homer then challenges him to it. Hibbert talks about how he was bought off, and then there's a big joke about a Heimlich machine, which is like some Tex Avery stuff there. It's a very Looney Tunes joke. How it, it feels like a John Swartzwelder joke, for real. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Homer then starts to eat away. He has some pretty funny jokes about saying, must defeat guy I just <laughs> met. I, I'm not going to play those clips because I think hearing Homer's eating sounds are gross. Yeah, so. they don't help the podcast. <laughs> You're not, not doing like uh, Talking Simpsons ASMR with just uh, Homer eating steak. <laughs> I, I try to cut down on gross sounds in this. That's also why there's there won't be a clip of when the doorbell is at its loudest later in this oh, episode. Oh, yeah, that annoyed me in my apartment. <laughs> Uh, but Homer's sinuses packed with mead is also really good. And his, his hallucination of the fancy cows, <laughs> who he calls drunks. I love that. Lousy drunks. <laughs> Lousy drunks. It's so weird that they do this joke that makes Homer not the bottomless stomached food monster. Like, he always is. There's there's nothing he can't eat in the show to this point. He, he closed down an all-you-can-eat food fish restaurant mm. because... He w- couldn't be finished eating. I-, I was thinking about that episode watching this too, but I couldn't remember what season that was from. Uh, that was uh, season four, right? Yeah. Is that that one has the great moment where uh, like the the prosecuting lawyer in court has them bring in like the equivalent amount of seafood that he ate and there's just this like convoy of people with these big bags of fish <laughs> but then but then homer's legal defense is the sign said all you can eat which i'm pretty sure would hold up in court <laughs> i i also like that the jury is an all uh obese jury and that could have been me i love that could have been that's yeah. one of my favorite lines. uh but yes homer reflects on that he's become everything he's ever hated i i like how bart's a real pal to homer in this episode yeah they're real chums <laughs> it's in this episode it's like a laurel and hardy adventure for these two homer has lost and red is still the champion but at what price <laughs> winner and still champion, Reliable Red Barkley. Hey, hats off to you, Red. You're a true American hero. And you did it with style and dignity. And, hey, you're not breathing. <laughs> Don't people usually breathe? This man is dead. Looks to me like beef poisoning. <gasps> Probably from some other restaurant. Oh, oh. the <laughs> <laughs> that joke always disturbs me because he has no reaction to dying. He just stops moving. His heart just stops. So uh, unless I was imagining it, uh, you can actually see him blinking. D- did you guys notice that? I think there's one blink the, after they pronounce him dead. I think there's an animation fuck up. There oh, yeah. Are. It might be an error then. Yeah. Yeah. But I love how he just dies with like, he dies doing what he loves. He's got this big smile on his face. Like, he like he he's like his facial expression like evokes a sort of thumbs up, you yeah. know, even though he's already dead. He also has the Al Bundy like hand tucked into his pants sort of yeah, thing yeah. maneuver. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and then Homer Homer comments on a, mo- a lot in this episode, but he kind of killed Red by yeah. challenging to this. Uh, it's manslaughter. Also, like if I was Homer, I'd be freaking out that like. There were two stakes. Homer could have been say, served the one that was poisoned, but he didn't. Like that, that would leave me uh, questioning my mortality for sure. But uh, Homer, Homer doesn't think that deeply. But I pin it as when the guy says "and still champion." That's when 
Red makes his last movement, and then they're just moving his hand around. Don't people usually breathe? That's a great I do like that line. So apparently they said on the commentary that there was some fears from Fox's lawyers about making jokes about beef poisoning. Be, uh, because they thought they were gonna they were gonna get it from the steak <laughs> lobby from from big steak. Uh, you, you're not far off there, yeah. Because in in 1998, Oprah was sued by Texas beef dudes because of a 1996 episode about Mad Cow, where she said like I'm never gonna after hearing this I'm never eating a burger again. They said that like this was Oprah saying that killed beef prices. We got a suit like so. Apparently, in some states, including Texas, have food libel laws where if you libel a food as saying it's dangerous without uh, proper proof of it, you can be sued for libel. And it was put to the test against Oprah. Oprah beat it. And so uh, there, there haven't been many food libel attempts afterwards, thanks to. See, it seems Lincoln. pretty, pretty. Cl- I mean, you think the First Amendment would apply, right? Imagine like you put a law, <laughs> like a moratorium, on just the abstract idea of suggesting that beef might poison you. This drawing of a steak poisoned the man. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you. Uh, well, that's the thing. It, it ended up these kind of laws, even if nobody gets sued. The intention is a chilling effect from like the beef lobby of just like companies people being scared to even mention a mad cow joke because they might get sued like well i hope uh, i hope at long last you know maybe the democrats can nominate bernie and he'll stand up to big steak at last <laughs> uh i can hope mad cow was a real fun go-to joke in the 90s it was sort of like the viagra joke standard if you couldn't come up with a viagra joke you had a mad cow joke waiting waiting ready to fire <laughs> And I just remember the uh, the Daily Show, like the last production logo was the Mad like Mad Cow Productions or whatever. Oh, yeah. It's like the cow says, Moo. "That's right." Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, fun. That, was, that was in the pre John Stewart days, right? I think so. Yeah, like I don't even know if they've ever made. A, I'm sure it's happened, but it's where they haven't done it yet mm. in this timeline that we're in now. Yeah, Make a Mad yeah. Cow joke. I guess this is kind of that. Yeah, but and those slaughterhouse body bags too. They do remind me of like the um, the dark branding, let's say, of the heart attack grill. If you've ever heard of that, oh man, yeah, <laughs> where people have had heart attacks at the grill and uh, people think it's a joke. So uh, that's uh, you know that not too far off there. Simpsons Simpsons satire just becomes real things. But uh, this is another of those uh, ends of the first acts where you just go like, didn't see that coming, did you? Uh, where this one is really oh, silly in this clip. They're leaning, they're leaning into it so hard. Like Homer knows, like, well, this is a sitcom. We need two more acts. And Marge, <laughs> I love Marge's reaction, even though it is like so contrived. I do like Marge's uh, just disbelief at this. There goes the finest trucker who ever lived. He called me Greenhorn. I called him Tony Randall. Hmm. It was a thing we had. In 38 years, he never missed a shipment. But I guess this is one delivery old red won't be making. Oh, yes, he will. And on time, too. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I've got you, honey. I owe it to old red as both his friend and his killer. Oh, let me go with you, Dad. Don't you have school? Don't you have work? Ah, too shabby. (laughs) Bye, Marge. (laughs) Aren't you going to say bye? Goodbye, Homer. That didn't sound like you meant it. All right. Goodbye, sweetheart. Have a nice trip. That's more like it. So long, suckers! (laughs) A nice Homer of this era, so long, suckers. Yeah, it wouldn't be a season 10 if he didn't say so long, suckers. You know, like this, this kind of turn from act one to act two made me think of is that, uh, you know, this particular episode anyway, and this is probably more, this is probably also applicable throughout other parts of season 10. It's much more like a family guy style of writing, like, especially after the early seasons of family guy, where the plots just become looser and looser to the point where, you know, often by the time you get to the third act, you've completely forgotten the first one because it's almost like three kind of little mini stories or two of them like uh, kind of sewn together. Um, And in fact, uh, I mean, not to jump the gun, but the episode actually kind of alludes to that later when there's that great joke about the end where like Homer can't remember who Red was. (laughs) Yeah. It's a little bit of meta humor. 
they're, they get a lot in these seasons, and this one especially of them pointing out their flaws of just like, the characters don't remember how this started, or Bart saying they're like, well, don't you have a job? Like, he's, yeah. he, Homer Homer shouldn't be able to just be a trucker when he has a job, he goes. There used to be stakes. I like how they just shrug them off. Like, you don't have to go to school, I don't have to go to work, so let's just do have our fun adventure. Yeah. They traded stakes for stakes. Ah, I like it. I, I like couldn't. it. Uh, <laughs> I made that terrible odd couple jokes, so uh, it's and, fair. And Marge, uh, I mean, Marge also kind of has a very Lois Griffin reaction of like, I'm so tired of sitcom zaniness. Please don't do this. <laughs> like, let's not. Uh, but she knows she can't stop Homer. Like, her body language, too, of like folded arms and kind of, she's like, please. Yeah. I, she just, there's a lot of. Uh, it's friend. emblematic of like the audience, like the Simpsons season 10 audience's resignation about like, all right, we're just going to do this again, I guess. <laughs> Off we go. Homer, this is a Homer's got a new job episode, I see. You got 15 more minutes of this. Uh, also, from this scene onward, consider this. There are migrant workers just loose in the oh. back of Homer's uh, truck the entire time. And what, avocados or something? It, 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 some avocados, yeah. yes. Yeah. Which, uh, that joke, I, I mean, the joke is about how horribly we treat migrant workers, but it also just feels like... A gross joke about immigrants. The human too. trafficking. Yeah, yeah. Red deserved to die. <laughs> you know, in je- he's a human trafficker. I guess he's pretty awful. Yeah. Yeah, there's that other great joke uh, in the same scene I just mentioned where, uh, like, he's talking to that uh, that other trucker and he says, you know, oh, last time I saw Red, he was in a plastic bag. And the guy's just like, huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like Red. <laughs> uh, he, he, it's pretty dark that he gets taken away in a hearse, too. Not an ambulance, even. Just in there. And, uh, it doesn't seem legal that they can just put should, him in their own branded body They bag. should do an autopsy or something. Homer drives away, we come back, and we see uh, the red rascal design, which is very intentionally a Tex Avery-style design, even. And also, like, there's a Confederate flag on it, because like, it's, it's just expected, like, truckers drive around with Confederate flags. No more no more conversation to be had on that. It's just... <laughs> it's a fun design. <laughs> who's, who knows why they got it? And also, I just, as a side note, I watch this on Simpsons World. I know, look, like, Disney Plus is bad, too. But I had to watch so many freaking commercials. Simpsons World is the worst. I'm so happy that this will be the last time I watch a Simpsons on Simpsons World. That uh, is, uh, is Watch Cartoon Online still around? N- uh, I would never frequent <laughs> such a website. That sounds unofficial. Oh, no, nor would I. I was asking uh, purely <laughs> hypothetically. Um uh, I may or may not have watched it on YouTube. Uh, hilariously enough, uh, I tried to watch it on Daily Motion, and it took me a minute to. Re- I was like, "So there's something off about this." If you guys have ever watched any clip on Daily Motion, not that of course any of us ever would have, but um, like all the clips are backwards for some reason. So all the like text in the credits oh, is backwards. Yeah. But then also this clip was just slowed down very slightly. So all the voices just sounded slightly off and it was like very hyper real. It was very strange. It's one of those tricks to get around a takedown for it. It's too, you know, there used to be a site I would never go to huh. uh, called Pixa Club, which that had every Simpsons like straight DVD rips in SD and I didn't have to do Futs around with any of the Fox, uh, the FXX bullshit. And it just, it. I was, for so many years, I was like, man, it's never getting shut down. This is so great. As Disney Plus looms, uh, now it's gone. There's no more Pixel Club. You can't pick make- it up shop. <laughs> It's great all the all these new platforms that are like finally all your favorite stuff in one place and then really it's just making everything harder to watch. <laughs> uh piracy gets tougher, but uh but we'll find a way, I think. <laughs> I'm going to have to play our boring conversation alert jingle. Well, let's define our terms, gentlemen. Are we talking about redistricting or are we talking about reapportionment? Because Oh well, I know can't win them all. But I do question, like, wait, if their skin is yellow, why would a sunburn make them red? Mm. Like, uh, I don't know. Shouldn't they be, like, orange, not red, in the way a person uh, with with Caucasian sp- skin pigmentation I would say be? all sunburns are red. That's my <laughs> argument. Classic uh, season 10, like, taking of liberties there by the writers. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, and uh, they also, the animators, I feel really bad for them that they... 
They had to draw that one price tag joke the entire goddamn episode. Yeah, and it's not really, I mean, it's, it's sort of like funny. a mini Pearl joke or something. Oh, uh, let's tell the mini Pearl story again. I, from my, my oh, wedding day, he was that That's uh, your uh, cruel parents thought. <laughs> I, I didn't know who mini Pearl was. Yes, yeah. At, uh, so at my wedding uh, with my husband, we both wanted to, and this was just at the city hall thing, but... We didn't want to have nice pictures, and we even got top hats, but we weren't going to pay for them. So we <laughs> we bought them from Amazon, and we're going to send them back, which we successfully did. They did have tags in them that we like tucked under the hats when we put them on, <laughs> but otherwise the tags were hanging out. And my uh, stepfather said, "Like, oh, you guys are like mini pearl, but you get you kids wouldn't know what that is." And and Bob had to let I it got know. in his face. I was like, <laughs> "Oh, from the Grand Old Opry, mean that mini pearl." I was a very lonely child, sir. <laughs> Uh, speaking of uh, silly jokes, they also have a joke of Homer turning on uh, the radio and listening to the Spice Girls with the then relatively new wannabe. Mm. Uh, in the deleted scenes, it's actually a joke about Dan. Dan Kesselman is playing a country singer, and he's he's singing this original song about the dangers of trucking, about like a truck flipped over on I ninety five, blood and guts everywhere, all this stuff. So that's why Bart has this reaction. You'll see it very briefly of like. What? Like he, yeah. he kind of freaks out, but I think they changed they maybe thought that was too long of a joke. So they just went with the easier joke of like Homer listens to a song for young women. That's that's it's uh it's oh, a come on, it's for everyone. Joke. Yeah. I I agree. The Spice Girls, they they want to spice up everybody and spice up the world. Uh Homer, I also like Homer thinking that the kid is telling him like fuck you with his honk the horn thing, which I think I got away with doing that a couple times as a kid. I've done it, yeah. But, uh, then we get a scene that I swear, I, at first I was like, this is egg magic, right? From the Super Bowl episode. Even the writers on the commentary are confused. Yes, but uh, but yes, Lisa and Marge are upset. They don't have a plot line, so they decide to start one. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, we got another postcard from your father. Wish you were her. How many of these is he going to send me? Wow, Dad and Bart have been everywhere. They've eaten submarine sandwiches, grinders, and hoagies. It's not fair. Your father always gets to have such exciting adventures. Maybe it's time we took a walk on the wild side. We're buying a new doorbell. A musical doorbell. So many doorbells. I'm in way over my head. (laughs) I like Marge. Marge suggests the most boring subplot possible, but she's overwhelmed by it. Also, Homer, side note, is so mean to Marge in this episode. The uh, sending multiple wish you were her postcards. And also, Homer plans on leaving Marge after he meets the waitress in the diner. Yes, he plans a divorce with Gwen. That's uh, pretty shocking. Really throws himself into this like hastily created new identity as a trucker, doesn't he? (laughs) Uh, And uh, the girl on the wish you were her, it's I believe that's a Betty Page uh, drawing. That's Betty Page, all right. But yes, they had to send your ding dongs, and I did want to play. This has uh, some great Gill work here, so I got to play the full Gill clip because he is uh, a truly sad individual. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, great! Look at my shoes, and today's my evaluation with Senor Ding Dong. Excuse me, Mister Trainee. I'm trying to find a musical doorbell. <laughs> Well, you came to the right place. We got your ding dang dongs and your do re mis and your ah cha chas. Ah, hey, man. I'm trying to find a particular tune. It's the one that goes like da 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 da. Mom, is this the one you want? Yes, that's it. Lisa, you ought to be a doorbell salesman. Oh, that's just what I need. Another piranha in the tank. <laughs> God. Rolling right into NRBQ. Uh, yes, yeah. That uh, man, Gil. Gil's sound he makes when he's called trainee, that makes the joke even better. Yeah. He's like, mm. <laughs> then, oh, God. And also that Marge, Marge can't remember Close to You, which is their song. Yeah. Which, the way she, like, Half remembers it is is very funny to me. I feel like that's the first time they've referenced it since that episode in this mm. timeline. So I, I didn't recognize the tune, but that's like, it's a Burt Bacharach song. Is that right? 
Yeah, it's it's close to you. It was made famous by the Carpenters, yeah. but uh, all, all I could think of was that it sounds like a like a melody you'd have to learn in Ocarina of Time. <laughs> played that game, and it would it would be called like you know the the Prelude of Fire, and it would take you to like the top of Death Mountain or maybe like Lake Hylia or something. <laughs> wow, that uh, you know I could totally hear that. Is a do 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 do. Yeah, in the uh, the way we was that was sort of like Marge's theme. Yeah, and Homer's yeah. was a space cowboy. <laughs> you know, I remember the last time we heard "Close to You." It was the Hindu cover of it oh, in uh, yeah. Apu's wedding episode last season. Yeah, but before that, I'm kind of fuzzy when it was used again. I think this was them rediscovering that "Close to You" was their song. It would come back a lot. It's in the movie. That's what's yeah. funny on the commentary. They 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 record the commentary as they're making the movie, so. They're like the, it's recorded like eight months before the movie comes out. So like, oh yeah, close to you. That's uh, in a big scene in the movie, and you can hear thirty seconds of it on the soundtrack. And they also have a joke in there about how they had just on the commentary they make a comment of like, oh, we just changed the villain of the movie because they just mm. did change their mind on Russ Cargill being played uh, how how he was played and animated. Which was a major last minute change. Like the the poor Simpsons movies animators who had to get like they had to redraw movie level animation so many times. I think there's like Burger King merch with the original design on it of I Russ Cargo. So, yeah. yeah. We'll get to the movie eventually. It'll be like a multi episode journey. That has to be five episodes, yeah. I think, of our podcast. But yeah, the uh it's it's funny to hear these commentaries that are now their own dated time capsule. Like 13 years old, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yes, Bob, you did bring up NRBQ. They they are in the next scene uh, in the diner where Homer is contemplating divorce. That's where they play NRBQ, Mike Scully's favorite band. Uh, the song is called 12 Bar Blues, if you want to give a listen to it. it. It is like the definition of dad rock. Like it's some of the dad rockiest. Dad. Not that it's bad, but it's, I don't, I don't think I'd go to an NRBQ concert, but that's just my taste. I would not be welcome at one. <laughs> <laughs> it'd, it'd be pretty mad at your hair, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Unless Mike Skelly took me. I li- said I was cool. <laughs> I like the sign outside the diner that says now we're now aware of camp value. I like that. Uh but yes, Homer Homer meets Gwen, which they do draw her in kind of a sexy manner. She also says, want some more high test? Which I had to look that up. That is an old diner expression for powerful coffee. Yeah, I was, I was assuming it was like a euphemism for just uh, the coffee because high test is just like uh, fuel, right? Uh, okay. You put in yeah. a truck, so yeah. just like I'm going to give you more fuel now. Mm-hmm. So, so she's it's like it's like it's like trucker diner. It's like road stop lingo, basically. Yeah, she's a colorful character, the kind we learned from Guy Fieri that he'd teach all. Of us. This would be a real dive he could visit. Uh, did you ever? Did you see a uh, friend of the show Bill Oakley's Guy Fieri outfit? Really it's good, real impressive Halloween costume. But yeah, the Homer plans to leave Marge for Gwen. And it makes it even darker that he's planning this in front of Bart while talking <laughs> to him. Just of like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to leave your mom. Yeah. After that scene's over, we head back to them trying to test out the uh, the doorbell. Uh, first, they think Millhouse is going to ring the door, but he gets uh, attacked by birds while selling seeds. More more evil birds, Bob, in these things. <laughs> At least no birds were hurt. I, I, what was so funny about, about this to me is the idea that the they can't legitimately test the doorbell unless somebody just like comes to the door organically. I don't know why that tickled me so much, but just how they, they like sit there waiting. And then the fact that what's there's like, they're thwarted twice first because Millhouse, who is inexplicably just walking down the street selling bird seeds, like gets attacked Hitchcock style. <laughs> and then they try to overcome that by just ordering not pizza, but like, what is it? Like a, a like a piece of garlic bread. Yeah, or like a half like order this. of garlic bread. <laughs> Yeah, and then that guy just knocks on the door. <laughs> yeah, I I kind of like it uh, as a character tick of Marge that she's like, it's not an official test of the doorbell unless a stranger rings it, not them. She's kind of a doorbell nerd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's such, such and and also right before that though, the Jehovah's Witnesses show up and they just they quit. They yeah. quit before <laughs> ringing the doorbell. <laughs> I love that, but uh, let's go get real jobs. <laughs> I, you know, I don't think the when I moved to Berkeley 13 years ago, I did get a few Jehovah's Witnesses in, uh, in the first few years I was here, but I haven't seen them around in a while. I feel like they've get at least in the 
Bay Area they've given up. I mean, it's they funny. See a- uh, I I got like I I grew up in I grew up rural, and even though we had a really long driveway, they would like come up. It, it was like a five minute uphill drive to get to the house, but they would come all the time. But since I've lived in Toronto, I don't think I've uh, I don't think I've been canvassed by a Jehovah's Witness. They give up the big cities to the Satan. That's they yeah. just gave up. Satan's <laughs> one. Uh, We're in his thrall. Uh, but yeah, I like uh, they they try calling Luigi's, and uh, that's when the they finally have to give up. Still no visitors. It's time we opened up a can of whoop tushy on this situation. What's the number for Luigi's? Dad's got it on the speed dial under fire. This is it, honey. We did it. Damn it! Uh, ring the bell! <laughs> Why? You already know I'm here, don't you? Just do it! Nothing doing, Missy. <laughs> now, do you want your half order of garlic bread or not? No, but if you'll just ring the bell... <sighs> oh, that's it. I'm putting an end to this. Lisa, no, 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 it won't be the... <gasps> oh, it's heavenly. Why do birds suddenly appear over there? Over here. <laughs> Why is it playing over again? Who cares? No one could ever get sick of this song. Suddenly appear. <laughs> and then it keeps going and going. Very loud. I was surprised yeah. by how annoying it was uh, <laughs> through my speakers. Credit to the sound engineers, I guess, for it really shrill. breaking it up there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, that Mar- I also like added to that that Marge not only would call... Luigi, but she didn't even order like dinner. She's just like, no, it just one half order of garlic bread. I'm gonna be as cheap as possible for this delivery. And then having like, you know, she's she, like, it doesn't count. It hasn't counted until now that, uh, you know, like if if unless somebody rings the door organically, but then as soon as the bell goes, she's just like, she's just in a state of bliss. You know? <laughs> uh, with with a song that she can't even remember, like the the. 10th word to which is why do birds suddenly appear every time that you're near just like me they long to be close to you i think it's every time you are near oh well, I, f- no I fucked up too non-musical that in uh, that song <laughs> no i I, I, I trust you <laughs> uh but yeah homer then we go back to his adventures he's there at a drive through he's eating what looks to be a stucky's brand peanut pecan log roll mm. that's what i think it is uh and they're seeing a movie called it ate everybody which it ate everybody the the constant restatement of it is pretty funny yeah the, uh, and it feels that, like a john swartzwater joke to me uh i my favorite is they have brad in the reflection as they all homer Bart and the actor all say, it ate everybody. And Homer had stupid. That would have been a fun callback for this to be Space Mutants, wouldn't it? That they lost fun. that so long ago. Yeah, it's, it, it it's been almost been a, a decade. <laughs> so Homer and Bart are trying to catch fish using fishing sticks, as Homer calls them, which is kind of odd. Bart tells him that uh, they actually have to get to Atlanta. Remember, Atlanta is the destination. And Bart reminds him they actually have to drive 2,200 miles in 10 hours uh which is impossible in a in that truck i think if you were even going 120 miles an hour you couldn't do that like the uh don't underestimate the power of stim you crank <laughs> i i looked up on google what is 2200 miles from atlanta and there's a lot of major cities but la is that far so i'm wondering uh, if they were using the los angeles me- measurement to sounds atlanta. like it and google says that'll take 32 hours to do so uh i have to think by the at this point all the other times we see Homer, he either like stops every mile or else he uh, drove in the wrong direction. One of those <laughs> two things. Uh, but yeah, Homer Homer then gets uh, hopped up on pills, which they said the censors were also not happy about. Well, he does bounce them out with sleeping pills, which I think is another problem, too. Overdosing on sleeping pills sounds like a really bad idea. Yeah, it sounds like a suicide attempt. Homer nearly do- dies twice just by the second commercial break in this one. Uh, they, but they also make sure to say that Congress hasn't yet made them illegal, so Homer's not committing a crime when he takes them. <laughs> they're racing back to Washington right now. But they're even called stimu crank, so they're like, it, it's crank. They're talking about meth. Uh, but yes, Homer, I do really like Dan's acting in this next bit here where he's uh, freaking out and, and then passing out in, in succession. Uh, yeah, I need something that'll keep me awake, alert, and reckless all night long. Well... Congress is racing back to Washington to outlaw these. So, 
Hey, you can't take that many pep pills at once. No problem. I'll balance it out with a bottle of sleeping pills. <laughs> okay, we're all set. Let's put the pedal to the metal. I hardly agree. Oh, man, I'm really wired. This is a big mistake. I go. Oh, here comes the sleeping pills. So drowsy. Pep pills perking up again. I can drive on. It's quite a neck break. <laughs> yes, yeah. They are seemingly about to drive off the, the road and, and die. Off a cliff. Uh, the, you know, the pep pills also remind me of uh, Lisa's pep pill addiction. Oh, yeah, Trucker's <laughs> Choice. Yeah. Uh, the, the Simpsons are very addictive personalities when it comes to uh, pills. Homer's acting there is really great. We come back and it's the exact same shot. They don't often do that in Simpsons of like where a commercial break comes back. It's the exact place where it ended. The car just writes itself and a computer turns on and drives them all the way to the gas station to the gassy knoll. That's when Homer finds out that uh, <laughs> that all ca- trucks are automated secretly. He learns a dangerous union secret. Yes, yeah. Actually, yeah. Why don't we hear the um, the dangerous, violent, and lazy union here? <laughs> You'll never believe what happened. I fell asleep at the wheel and the truck drove here by itself. Yeah, that Navitron auto drive system's made our jobs cushier than ever. <laughs> the what now? You know this thing. With this baby driving your truck for you, all you gotta do is sit back and feel your ass grow. The trucks drive themselves? <laughs> hey, 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 shh. Didn't your union rep tell you about the scam we got going? Well, I'm not really a trucker, so I don't talk to the rep that often. All right, listen, pal, here's the deal. You stumbled on a secret that only truck drivers are supposed to know. (laughs) Hey, pay attention and stop looking at that squirrel. We get 40 bucks an hour to drive these rigs. You think anybody would hire us if they knew we weren't really driving the trucks? Wow, you guys are even lazier than me. (laughs) Well, don't worry. I'll keep your secret. See that you do. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, so you know what's so funny about this? Like, it's obviously you know, yeah, pure like Reaganist take on like you know, blue collar truckers and you know, like uh, union workers in general. But what's so funny about this is the idea that if there was technology uh, that allowed you to automate trucking, the union would control it. Yes. Like, like obviously, what would really happen if this were possible? Like, if like if someone like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos ever you know, gets their hands on this kind of technology. It's not going to mean that uh, people get like blue collar guys get cushy $40 an hour union jobs. It's going to mean that those jobs all disappear. Well, and it'll just be like at best temps who sit there, contracted employees who just sit there to make sure it stays on track. Like, yeah. And they'll probably have to sit in the trucks and like do something else like code or something at the same time. Answer emails. Like, yeah, it'll be like, uh, it'll be like mobile sweatshops, like enabled by Um. app. Yeah, I, I, I'm guessing in the fictional world of The Simpsons, the truckers' union invented this technology <laughs> and kept it a secret. <laughs> we are we are entering the world of uh, automated driving, though. Yeah. It's it's weird. Like whenever you log into a website now, you're like helping teach cars how to drive by like identify all the stop signs. Ooh, and just like that, no one's uh, paying me to do this to teach cars how to drive. It's like, uh, oh, where's the crosswalk? Find the crosswalk. That's evil. I, yeah. I actually love the idea of a, like a truckers' union owning the technology to automate trucking. That's like workers owning the means of production. That yes, w- were that to be the case, I do like that. I, though they are made to be villains for doing that in this episode. That's uh, I. I will say on the commentary, the writers, as proud union members themselves of the WGA West, they did uh, have some laughs of like, boy, we sure write some evil unions in this show, don't we? Like they, I think they felt slightly uh, um, embarrassed about going there. Well, actually, you know, the automated, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, Bob or Luke, that how automated truck driving, I've seen it used as like a scare, as a scary fact brought up, not by uh, left wing like or socialist leading people but by like tucker carlson and like white nationalist adjacent guys oh no no hey luke have you seen this what is like the reactionary white nationalist take on automated trucking i'm having trouble constructing it in my mind me eye. too yeah well so uh there <laughs> uh, this came from me seeing this clip of like ben shapiro talking to tucker carlson and ben shapiro is just like 
I welcome automated trucking. You know, it'll it'll get it's it's the future. It's where it's where uh, the companies are going. And then Tucker Carlson actually got like really pissed. He's like, all those people out of jobs, it, it would destroy their jobs. Like that would uh, that would you can't just let capital reign free to destroy people's livings. And, okay, I get it. So this yep. is part of like Tucker's whole thing about like this. So this is like part of the sort of fake economic populism that he's trying to you know oh. do from the right because it's like if it was uh if automation you know made it so that like migrant workers didn't have to like break their backs you know harvesting a crop or something you know he wouldn't give a shit about that but when it's trucking which is like you know a crucial to like that's a crucial identity he wants to assimilate to his project so that actually makes a lot of sense yeah. wow it's amazing how much uh it's amazing how much social commentary you can wring from like a twenty-year-old episode of The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, I I was just thinking about I when I saw that clip, I was thinking of this episode, and I've I've seen it brought up by like alt light adjacent people I- I- that I <laughs> come into contact with sometimes on Twitter. They're just like, oh man, you see all these trucking jobs, and they're gone. I mean, it's also a predominantly, or at least perceived as, I don't know the, the you know actual statistics on it, but I would I would think it's fair to say it is perceived as a primarily white job. Mm. So it is the type of thing Tucker Carlson and people who only worry about the jobs of white people talk about. And, I, and especially it's like this kind of gross thing in white nationalism now of like they take... They take just a morsel of the kind of stuff like Bernie and other lefty politicians are talking about now, but make it only as a way to help, as a talking point to help white people, like or a white working class kind of. It's it's really it's really gross. I can't, so watching this episode, I I hated thinking of Tucker Carlson, but I did. Uh, imagine his big <laughs> face now. Oh God! Ugh. But uh, but yeah, so I do think that will be a problem, though, because mm. I think like it's another argument for you know a bigger social safety net as more people in, in many types of jobs get made unemployed by automation. Yeah, we've been yeah. on this point for a while, but I do want to say that uh, the fear of automation is also used to scare people out of asking for more at their jobs. Oh, like yeah. uh, you know, if you work at McDonald's and you ask for fifteen dollars an hour, you're asking to be replaced by a kiosk. And uh, this is not an original thought, but they're going to replace you anyways. Yeah. So you might as well get the most out of that job you can before everything is a kiosk. If if the person running the register didn't ask for 15 an hour, McDonald's wouldn't have put research into doing an automated kiosk? Like, of course not. No. I just love the idea that Tucker Carlson, you know, cares a great deal about, like, the livelihoods of blue-collar truckers. On happier notes, I uh, <laughs> I like that, that squirrel, Homer being distracted by a squirrel is a pretty easy joke, but I do like that it's drawn like a dotted eye season one squirrel. Like a real life and hell design. Yeah, I like that. But yes, Homer Homer is warned by his, I love him saying like, well, I don't talk to my union rep very much because <laughs> I'm not a trucker. And so Homer promises he won't tell. And then, of course, he instantly tells Bart all about it. Hey, Bart, watch me run down this old lady. Dad, no! (laughs) (laughs) The second I let go of the wheel, this little wonder kicks in. And if scaring old ladies don't float your boat, watch this! (laughs) Come on out, boy! It's windy! Wow, you're right, Dad. It is windy! Look, nobody's driving. Well, we'll never see Relax, everybody. The Navitron Auto Drive System is driving the truck for me. <laughs> keep it a secret. It's a big scam, okay? I love that line. <laughs> keep it a it's secret. It's a big scam, okay? <laughs> Bob, I think I've said to you many times, you're right, Bob. It is windy. windy. Yeah. It's just that statement by Bart that is just so matter of fact like it is windy or he didn't believe Homer and that it would be windy <laughs> on the windshield uh, but also, also the way Homer Homer tricks Bart like hey Bart watch me run, this old, run down this old lady which of course the worry with automated driving is that they will run over people but uh, I, I don't know I guess I mean, we've run over, people run over people all the time what's the what no cars run over people Henry oh that yeah <laughs> Uh, also, the that's a type of voice you never hear in The Simpsons. That accent, the one was like, "Hey, look, nobody's driving." Like, I don't know. That's a kind of random accent you don't normally hear from like peanut gallery characters in The Simpsons. 
Uh, and so Homer's revealing the secrets. They uh, he gets caught by a truck driver. That gets called in. There's a real pause. Uh, pause the screen joke to read uh, all the different codes uh, that have like what different codes mean. My favorite is actual bear in the air. Mm. Uh, but there's another one that's like. I love you, gay daddy. It's gay buddy. Gay buddy. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. I uh, instead of good buddy. Instead oh, of good buddy. I got it. Gay okay. buddy. That makes more sense than daddy. I, uh, <laughs> I was seeing what I wanted to see there. Um, <laughs> and they have a reference to Jimmy Hoffa there too, which uh, that uh, I can't wait to watch the Netflix original film, The Irishman, to finally learn the secret of Jimmy Hoffa's death. As those guys go off to kill Homer, we then see Marge trying to turn off the doorbell. Even as uh, she can't do any work on it with tools because the, they all got traded for M and M's. Though I would think Homer would have eaten all those M and M's anyway. He could have just forgotten about them. <laughs> they were like their uh, secret stash. And Marge pulls the wrong wire, and then the door- the doorbell song starts playing faster and louder, showing that the entire neighborhood can hear it at that point. I'm glad there's no clip of that. <laughs> Uh, And then Homer and Bart get uh, confronted, though. Homer doesn't seem to think it's any big deal at first. Look, son, it's one of nature's most beautiful sights, the convoy. He hit us. Oh, I should have known. They're hazing us to initiate us into the trucker's fraternity. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Dad, they're trying to kill us. Oh, why do all my trips end like this? Eat water, good buddy. Ah! Whoa, look at him roll. <laughs> oh, my good knife. My wife's going to kill me. I think we lost him, Bert. Dad, stop. Uh, that, th- Homer kills that guy. Yeah, right? he's dead. I mean... I guess it's self-defense to get him off the windshield, but I think he might be standing later in the when we last see all the truckers. But so a bunch of dangerous union thugs are trying to kill a man and his son for daring to reveal union secrets. That's uh, getting pretty evil. <laughs> also, leave it to the Harvard guy writers to think that it's like a frat spanking and in- initiation at first. That's a it, including the animal house. Thank you, sir. May I have another kind of gag? So also Homer is right. His new friends often do try to kill him at this point in the series. Yeah, I, f- I feel like it's a common theme uh, in like this era onwards where Homer gets a job and the new world that he's part of wants to kill him or tries to kill him. The other mm-hmm. one I'm thinking of is the, when he becomes a food critic. Oh yeah, yeah. That and uh, and before that, well, they instead start the No Homers Club. But the uh, the Stonecutters at first were going to just kill him too. If they had listened, no, really to wanted Orville, to. <laughs> if they listened to Orville, Jack, and Mister, they also would have done it. Uh, and yes, Homer Homer drives away. Uh, thinks he's escaped. It's a really weird cut after the the guy with the knife tr- uh, drops his knife. Then it just cuts to Homer and Bart's truck being left alone, and they're like, "Oh, I guess we got rid of him." No, he didn't like. There's there's something missing there yeah, for sure. Maybe a cutscene or something. Homer is there somehow gets surprised by a giant blockade of trucks, which that's uh, that's a good little visual gag there. Uh, and then the Homer thinks that the auto driver is going to help, which uh, the auto driver has other plans. In this uh, one more clip here. Looks like we got ourselves a showdown, boy. <laughs> All right. What are you doing? I'm keeping a promise to an American roadmaster. Huh? Red. The trucker! Big fat guy couldn't handle his steak? Oh, yeah. (laughs) We'll get past that barrier somehow. Old Blinky here will find a way! I'm afraid I can't let you do this, Red. The risk is unacceptable. I'm not Red, I'm Homer. Gotta go. And uh, gets to safety, the the auto driver, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, I forgot that there's a Hal from 2001. Yeah, joke here. it's uh, not the most uh, re- uh, relevant joke to make or not the l- uh, least dusty joke to make, but I do like gotta go. <laughs> uh, you know, Simpsons love to reference Kubrick, though. And uh, there's a great Homer scream there, too. I, I like also that that's when the auto driver realizes it's not red and he has to go away. Uh, 
And then Homer does an insane super flip over the trucks yeah, and he, lands like, perfectly. Jack knifes the truck so it vaults over the convoy. It's a really good piece of animation that uh, they didn't like reading in the script, <laughs> the uh, animators. they they created- you, know, you know what I thought of at this point was, uh, I don't know if you guys ever saw it, but one of the worst video games of all time is called Big Rigs, and it's like a truck like truck racing game oh, yeah, or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it like now? Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't work well enough for you to actually flip the truck, as in this scene. It was like a game where there was like famously bad collision detection. Just one of those N sixty four games that, like, like the Superman one, that just like didn't work on even the most basic level. So you could like you go over a bridge and you'd like actually hit the side of the bridge, but then you just sort of go right through it. It it also had the worst sound of any video game that I've ever played where instead of like a soundtrack, they just have this like single monotonous drone that's supposed to be a truck engine just going all times. Oh yeah. I I've seen that where people even like drive, drive through the ground eventually and just (laughs) fall into nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Just fall into oblivion into the ether. Yeah, actually, uh, it's funny you bring that up. A a previous guest on this podcast, Alex Navarro, he was one of the people to review that when it was new for GameSpot. It was, it was. I'm Game so relieved you. I'm so relieved you didn't say he was one of the designers. No, the no, no, no. He was killed by that game this very night. <laughs> uh, yeah, he gave. I believe it was the first zero on GameSpot. I think it was. He's. Uh, Good old Alex. He's uh, Alex Navarro. He's uh, folks should listen to his uh, Giant Bomb uh, podcast appearances. He's good. But uh, driving a big rig isn't fun though. It's all about monotony and just uh, endurance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I never actually played that game. I uh, the reviews scared me away from it. Yeah, you're not missing much. Oh and yeah, the uh, the driving of that, the rolling of it, they credited to Mark Irving, who they also credited to drawing the like. Uh, incredible homer drives with a boot on his car animation oh yeah any sort of vehicle animation they gave to him mark irving is like the king of animating cars in this they 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 also say like uh, i think it's swin scott on the commentary says like he bought a model truck of the truck in the episode just to understand it better to draw it which like that's that's the kind of extra effort those animators put in that, you know, if you just read Simpsons on a script level, you don't really think about. Like I, That's why I like hearing from the animators on the commentaries. Uh, I should say it's actually, it's Mark Irvin. Oh, Irvin. And he would direct on Futurama. I think oh. where we just talked about one of his episodes in season two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. And yeah, Homer just drives away. And uh, that's when uh, the truckers seemingly learn their lesson. I like, too, that they imply that all their... Uh, their dads drove drunk when they were young. I do like uh, Hank's sort of like ad libby reaction to that. He's like, no, 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 <laughs> no. Yeah, it's very good. It's very good. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, also to put it in 1999, a Beanie Babies reference as well, which they they couldn't have been bigger in the states mm-hmm. in 1999. Yeah, actually, uh, what was it? I I saw somebody share on Twitter a while back. What these classic like taped off TV, oh yeah, uh, like shopping channel things for all the Beanie Babies listening. Like we got this one, we got that one. Like all the all the hyper specific names to famous Beanie Babies, which I don't have memorized because I was not a Beanie Baby collector. I think the top uh, pick is the Princess Diana Memorial Beanie uh, Baby. I think it's still the most valuable one at like forty dollars. Wow. Actually, the friend of mine whose dad was a trucker that I mentioned earlier in the episode, his mom was a pretty big connoisseur of Beanie baby so oh, it's perfect wow this episode, this episode works on so many levels there's uh, this is the proof that the show was on to something they tapped into it uh <laughs> i guess by the implication that they all just go like now nah, let's sell beanie babies bootleg beanie babies does that mean that in the reality of the simpsons every trucker quit their job because they feared homer had exposed it all just this union just that group yeah okay it's... Well, after the collapse of the the bit the steak industry, there's nowhere else for them to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I guess that maybe they could just add a little line in here that would make it all all work logically. They say, like, "Well, now the company knows about it; they're just going to use it and fire all of us." Like it's, uh, but we don't see this technology uh, after this in The Simpsons. <laughs> never. You know, it's one of those many like Joe. It's like the how the USSR returned in The Simpsons, and then that never mattered again, even though Lenin's body is seemingly still marching around after <laughs> being reactivated and crushing capitalism uh but yes homer heads off to make his drop off also imagine what happened to those poor migrant workers when homer did that like triple oh, flip yeah. as well that's not to think about it 
but yes, Homer makes his delivery. This is Red Barclay's shipment on time as always. All right, let's see. Artichokes and migrant workers. Looking good. So where is old Red, anyway? Well, the last time I saw him, he was in a big plastic bag. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Red, all right. <laughs> well, son, I guess it's time to go home. Any thoughts on how we're going to get there? No, but I'm sure the good Lord will provide. Are you crazy? I'm not driving a train load of napalm to Springfield. Thank you. <laughs> so he gets another job in an episode we don't see. <laughs> Homer drives home to, in a railroad car. Yeah. That's, uh, again, the show really selling itself out in its reality of like, Homer knows he's in a sitcom and another another new job will fall into his lap to get him home. Uh, it's uh, it's It does sell out the show again, but it's a funny gag of Homer just l- instantly trading hats. <laughs> he wore one hat, now he's wearing another one. I do remember on the commentary, they're having problems finding something that could be in the truck. Like, what would the delivery be? And the first joke was nothing. Like, there was nothing inside of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> he was just taking an empty truck back to the place. I, uh, You know, I ki- the randomness of it, I kind of like it. It's better, you know, the same joke at the end of the Critic episode was delivering politically correct books. Oh, yeah. At, uh, I, I prefer this joke to that. But that was back in the, like, 1993 version of Politically Correct, where it was yeah, like yeah. they were uh, taking out, like, facts that could offend people or something. I don't know. He or she, son. He oh, yeah. Or she. Oh, I forgot about that part of the joke. Never mind. <laughs> I was thinking of the Malcolm X uh, joke. The uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. The Malcolm, the parody of the movie X, the Politically yes. Correct version or whatever. Uh, but then we get to the truth true ending of the episode i think i think they made the right move of having the incredibly silly appearance of senor ding dong be the end of the episode instead of homer putting on another hat and getting into a train uh but yes here is the debut of senor ding dong i'm really sorry everybody but i've tried everything i'm afraid we're just going to have to learn to live with it no 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 dice all right chimey this time, the bell tolls for thee. Huh? Ay, 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 Senor Ding Dong. I thought you were just a marketing gimmick. There was a time when that was true, but now I am so much more. Mm, oh, my. Gracias, Senor. De nada. If you ever need me, just ring. Ring. Does anyone have any jumper cables? <laughs> oh, you stinking Chevy. Just vapor lock. <laughs> vapor lock. <laughs> that whip is so close to Lisa's face. That was what yeah. struck me this time. It's like, a great design for Senior Ding Dong. I love Senior Ding Dong's design, yeah. Uh, also, I love the design of Wiggum in his PJs, but wearing his gun belt. It's like, like a sort too. of like a cop pajama outfit he's <laughs> wearing there. Uh, but yeah, Senior Ding Dong apparently came in pretty late. They're just like, what if he just showed up? What if he? What if that was just the end of it? Yes. I guess given that he's, he's trying to drive the car, we can safely assume that the truckers union hasn't shared it it's like self-driving technology with the doorbell delivery people. <laughs> uh, he's not a part of the union yet, I guess. I guess he never will be. They're not letting him in on it. His the ding dong hat. I I just love his his design. Is uh, it's funny. He he apparently did make one other on-screen appearance in uh, the series after this. In season twenty-nine, uh, there's a bowling team called the One and Duns, which is a collective of one-off ridiculous characters, including like Sir Kissalot. Well, I don't even know what he's mm. from, but Senor Ding Dong is one of the guys on the bowling team. So, so, so season twenty-nine aired when, like a few years ago, two, right? like two years ago. We're in thirty-one now, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So that's like a ref. That's like a literally a only '90s kids will remember type of reference. <laughs> uh, Where were you when Senior Ding Dong was on the screen, <laughs> getting ready for Futurama? Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, saying to your mom like, Qu- "Quick, Futurama's about to premiere. Get the new other tape." Yeah, the uh, that's pretty. Having Senior Ding Dong come back is is pretty close to the when Ho- Lisa sends a Homer meme to Homer in an episode of The Simpsons, like just them admitting just how very very long the show has been on but uh senior ding dong saves the day with a whip that somehow makes the doorbell stop but it's uh you know it's a magic whip who who's to say but uh yeah it was uh 
a that was a wacky ass episode. Yeah, and I mean, I guess the show admits that it is very wacky. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, no stakes, just a lot of fun, uh, Schwarzweldery uh, violence and mayhem and anti union sentiment. You know what? Well, you say you say low stakes, but there are actually lots of stakes. All right, the stakes uh, are okay. pretty high off the ground, and they're big. <laughs> they're big stakes. Seventy two ounces worth of stakes. You know, it just hit me. The last episode we had Luke on was also written by John Schwarzwelder. That's right. And it was about workers, uh, but the nuclear power plant workers all going on a, a retreat together. But uh, that's uh, it's funny how that works out. But this this episode is about as crazy as Mountain of Madness. There's no rocket house. <laughs> that's true. The rocket house is crazier than the self-driving truck. A so rocket house without brakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the sort of random quality of this episode didn't really bother me. I, I, it's been a few years since I've watched anything from season 10. But by and large, I felt that like the weirdness of this episode and the kind of arbitrariness of the plot. Um, they're pretty self-aware and I'm actually okay with that. Like the Simpsons starts to get dodgy when it starts, you know, I, you, I don't know what your guys thoughts is on this, but when it starts kind of altering the basic premises of the universe, like to me, random plots, as long as they're self-aware are fine. But then when they start like, killing off characters or substantially revising the backstories to characters or changing just visually like the look and the feel of the show. That's when it really starts to lose me. I'm going to be interested to, when like you guys inevitably get like into those much later seasons to hear what your thoughts on them are. We're heading up to the uh, death of Maude Flanders soon. Oh, so it's a, oh, that's a big one. Yeah. I, I keep wanting to mentally push it away and think it's farther yeah. away. When, are... when is the uh, when is the Armin Tanzarian episode? Is that season twelve? Oh, oh no, no, that's in our past. That was yeah. uh, the end. Oh, you've already passed that one. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That and was... we have recently redecided that it is a good episode. Yeah, so. yeah. It's... Oh yeah, it's it's not bad at all. It's just it's just like a weird sign of, of it's kind of an ominous sign of things to come. <laughs> uh, well, this you know the, the wackiness this episode i'm with you luke that it's uh i think the wackiness is is great and it's what they're they're best at in season 10 is being irreverent and silly and making homer into like this honestly monster who is ready <laughs> to leave marge at the drop of a hat and uh kind of thoughtlessly kills a lot of people in this i think the the lesser episodes in these seasons are when they try to do sentimentality with this Homer that they've turned into like a crazy cartoon, it, yeah. it doesn't work as well. Well, that's what I remember from the one time I saw the Simpsons movie is that it was actually trying to re-embrace some of the sentimentality that had punctuated the Simpsons before it really discovered irony in like season three. Like it was actually, it's, there was like a saccharine quality to some of, it, some of it, if I'm remembering rightly, that weirdly mm. harkened back to like really early kind of proto Simpsons, although it was actually less good than some of those really early episodes, as I remember. Yeah, I find the movie to be pretty mediocre, and I had seen it recently as of this recording. So yeah, I can't wait to get to that in our podcast series. So I'm a I'm a B minus on it. I'm not mm. as uh, as much of a I'm hater. A C plus, <laughs> take that. Uh, but yeah, I guess uh, that'll still be like five years from now. Yeah, right? so look forward to that. <laughs> yeah. You guys have signed yourself up for so many more episodes of this. It's incredible. It's the most job security I've ever had in my life. <laughs> I can't uh, say no well, to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Simpsons writers. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, thank you, Luke, for doing the yeah. podcast. Yeah, please promote all of your stuff. You've got the great Michael and Us podcast, and we just mentioned a few episodes up top. Anything else that's going on with you? Oh, sure. Well, people can uh, people can check out my writing at uh, Jacobin. I'm a staff writer there now, so I'm doing stuff every week. Uh, yeah, Michael and us. Uh, I feel like we don't remember to plug it often enough on the show. But if if people have been listening on their podcast app or on SoundCloud, um, you know, they may not actually realize we've had some listeners report this that we also have a Patreon. So <laughs> if you contribute at the Al Gore level of five dollars a month, uh, you can get an extra episode. Uh, well, two extra episodes a month. Month. so uh please contribute if you can he lives on my street i've heard yeah <laughs> yeah and he won the popular vote as well <laughs> uh, but no yeah i uh yeah also folks you definitely read your work jacobin at the time of this recording he just uh, published a article about uh, the history of the term neoliberalism that i really enjoyed oh appreciate it cheers yeah 
So thanks again to Luke Savage for being on the show. Be sure to check out his podcast, Michael and Us, and his work at The Jacobin. But as for us, if you want to support our show and get every episode one week ahead of time and ad-free, please go to patreon.com slash talking simpsons. You'll get just that. And if you sign up for five dollars a month, you'll also have access to all of our mini series we've done and other bonus podcasts on top of that. There's too many to list here, frankly, but we mentioned it during this podcast recording. We're currently doing Talking Futurama season two, part one. 10 episodes of Talking Futurama Season 2 to get you through the end of 2019, and they're hitting every Friday. You won't want to miss them at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And Henry, we have a newer, well, I guess it's not new anymore. It's a year old officially. A year old. A year old tier that is fresher and newer than ever every month because we bring you one extra, extra long podcast every month about a movie. What's happening there? That's right. For $10 and up subscribers at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons, we have the What a Cartoon Movie Podcast, where me and Bob talk about a different animated feature film once a month, sometimes for over four hours for our Patreon subscribers. Last month in a Halloween style, but also it works for the whole holiday season, we did Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. We talked a ton about that movie and its interesting long gestation period. And this month, we'll be doing Toy Story as our What a Cartoon movie. We're finally doing the first Pixar film. And you can only hear that full podcast when it happens in November if you're a $10 and up subscriber at patreon.com slash Talking Simpson. As for me, I've been one of your hosts, Bob Mackey. Check me out on Twitter as Bob Servo. And I have another podcast. It's called Retronauts. It's a classic gaming podcast. Every Monday, occasionally on Friday, go to retronauts.com or look for Retronauts in your podcast machine. If you've ever played a video game in your life, you'll find something worthwhile to listen to in our feed. Henry, how about you? Hey, I'm Henry Gilbert. Follow me on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. Anytime there's new podcast up, I'm sure to tweet about it, either on uh, the Patreon or on the free feed. You'll learn about it from my Twitter feed, as you will. If you follow the official Talking Simpsons Twitter account, please follow that. We just updated it. It's maintained by our wonderful friend of the show, Nina Matsumoto. Follow it on Twitter at Talk Simpsons Pod. One more time at talk simpsons pod you will stay up to date a new podcast there as well follow them both on twitter thanks for joining us this week everybody we'll see you next week for the episode simpsons bible stories and we'll see you then Stupid!